My name is Gerald, pastor of Innovate Church in Kannapolis, North Carolina. Tonight we're looking at episode 4 of Isaiah's Words, where we are looking at the various titles that Isaiah had told us. The baby that was to come 700 years later, he prophesied this before it happened, that the babe to come would have these four names. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. And tonight we're looking at Prince of Peace. We see when are we see pictures or stories being told or movies that have been produced now showing us what the night looked like or what the birth of Jesus looked like or the travel of Mary and Joseph. Most of the time, the pictures we see are peaceful and serene. You know, we see them traveling and usually it may be a, a silhouette of a hilltop or something and there's no one else around hardly. Stars in the sky, usually a clear blue sky. And it looks peaceful. Or maybe we've seen, you know, shepherds on a hillside when the angels came to pronounce the birth of Jesus. And we picture that as being a peaceful scene. Or even the, the magi, the wise men. We see them a lot of times in the desert area. And again, usually it's just three of them. But it's also usually a clear blue sky or a clear night sky with just stars. And then, of course, they have the, the Christ star up there for us to see. But the truth of the matter is, when Jesus was being born, whenever he, when Mary was pregnant, it was a time of turmoil for the Jewish people. For those in Nazareth where they were, it was a time of, of unrest, not peace, all of Israel at this time. For there was a difference in leadership coming to be as Herod the Great was, if not already passed, he was on the verge of passing had already killed his son for fear of him taking the, the rulership from him. And so there was political unrest going on. And then the, the trip itself wasn't like going from here to the next little town next to us. No, they were going from Nazareth to Bethlehem to respond to a census decree. But this wasn't a short trip. It wasn't just on a straight road to get there. They traveled all over various kinds of landscapes. Depending on what route they took, there are many different common routes to take. But the trip was between 80 and 90 miles for them to travel. And at a walking pace, it doesn't matter if there was a donkey and Mary was on it or not, they generally were in a walking pace. And so some say it took between four to seven days for that journey to be finished. So imagine doing that nine months pregnant as well. And in that, they also needed to walk within a caravan of people because of fear for robbers and bandits that knew those ways were being traveled. And if you didn't travel alone during that time, you needed somebody else to go with you. Let alone, it's also a census so that we know that many others from Nazareth also were going to travel that same road. But you also had all the wild animals out there to be fearful of if you were by yourself. The interesting thing is also that it is very possible that Mary didn't even have to make the trip because it was her spouse's duty to respond to the census. But the thing is, whether she had to go or whether she decided to go, it fulfilled prophecy. Because in Micah chapter 5, we've seen this before in our study, Micah chapter, chapter 5, he pronounces, he says, But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth from me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. So as we look at the reality of this trip that they had to take, it doesn't line up with the pictures or with the scenes that we've been shown throughout our time. Many an artist has drawn it, pictured it, painted it, and made it look as a peaceful time. You see, the Messiah throughout the Old Testament was always pictured as one that was going to bring about a time of peace, not war. That he was going to take over rulership from the throne of King David. Because you see, under King David, that's a time that the Israelites under his power and under God working through him and God doing miraculous things to keep him from being defeated from their enemies, God helped him to reunite 
all 12 tribes of Israel to expand and cover the land that was promised to them way back whenever Abraham had received the great covenant from God. And so Israel had become this nation that was experiencing a time of peace, what many would call the golden age of Israel. But we know that David was the one to complete all the battles, all the wars that they had to battle in. It wasn't until the end of his reign that they really got to experience peace. And in fact, it was his son that was over them for the 40 years of peace that they had. Listen to David's words for his son Solomon here as he is looking to Solomon being on the throne. This is recorded in Psalm 72. David prays, Give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to the royal son. May he judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. Let the mountains bear prosperity for the people in the hills in righteousness. May he defend the cause of the poor of the people. Give deliverance to the children of the needy and crush the oppressor. May they fear you while sun endures and as long as the moon throughout all, all generations. May he be like rain that falls on mown grass, like showers that water the earth. In his days may the righteous flourish and peace abound till the moon be no more. So what did peace mean to David? for the nation of Israel during that time. Righteousness, justice, prosperity, the end to all enemies, the care for the poor and the needy. And then I love his picture of peace. Rain that falls on the mown grass like showers that water the earth. That's a picture of peace to me as well. Did you catch the last line there? He said, may righteousness and peace abound till the moon be no more. Solomon was likely to pass before the moon was going to go away. So I believe that it is David's pointing to the future successor of that same throne his son was going to hold for a time. I believe it was messianic prophecy that he was saying. Yet in all that time, and we can look back now, and we know that though this babe came, though this Messiah has come and gone from the earth, there are many that did not believe. There's only a remnant, a few, that did. But as we've been looking at Isaiah's prophecy, found in chapter 9, we've looked at the various names that he has said the baby would be called. Isaiah 9, chapter 9, verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Yet as we've looked at that one scripture, as we do many times in trying to to preach or teach, we have to also look at the context of Isaiah's words. You see, the context found for chapter 9 is actually found back beforehand in chapter 8. Because in chapter 8, we have God pronouncing judgment upon the people of Judah. You see, once again, like they did many, many times throughout the Old Testament. If you read the Old Testament of the Bible, you see it all the time. The people disobey. They make their own idols. They make their own people they want to worship or things they want to worship. They turn from God. They get angry at God, whatever. God allows them to be punished, allows other nations to come in and bring destruction and ruin. They turn back to him because then he also saves them through it. And then they do it over and over again. So the same thing has occurred in chapter 8 of Isaiah, or at least he's prophesying that it's going to. You see, God is going to make use of the Assyrians to come in and plunder those in Judah. In fact, he describes them as a river 
that is going to overflow its banks into Judah. Listen to Isaiah chapter 8, verse 8 through 10. It says, It will sweep into Judah, speaking of Assyria. It will overflow and pass on, reaching even to the neck. And its outspread wings will fill the breadth of your land, O Emmanuel. Be broken, you peoples, and be shattered. Give ear, all you far countries. Strap on your armor and be shattered. Strap on your armor and be shattered. Take counsel together, but it will come to nothing. Speak a word, but it will not stand. For God is with us. You see, I find it, number one, interesting that many times we see God pronounces judgment upon the people. But then always there's a lining of his grace and his mercy. Right here we see it. You see, he's telling them that even though these people are going to come into your land, their plans are not going to come to full fruition. As he says, to take counsel together, but it will come to nothing. Speak a word, but it will not stand. And then he reminds his people, God is with us. I am with you. As we saw in the beginning of the pronouncement, it says, Oh, Emmanuel. We saw the word Emmanuel the other week when we looked at Mighty God being the title. Because Emmanuel, when broken down in the Hebrew, is El for God, E-L. And Emmanuel for with us. And so even though the enemy was going to come and attempt to shatter God's people, God reminded them that he is going to be with them. And then he goes on to remind the people to trust in the Lord. He tells them to ignore the various conspiracies that they're going to hear. Ignore the things that people tell you to fear about the earth. And fear only the Lord and worship him. And then Isaiah goes on to say that for those that do not heed his words. Understand they're going to find themselves in a time where they are distressed, hungry. They're going to become enraged against the king and against God. And then he tells them they're going to be in distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will find themselves thrust into darkness. You see, that is the backdrop for the good news of Isaiah 9, that although these things are going to happen to you, there's more to come to the story. But how do they find peace? I got a little story for you, a little story picture, I guess you would say. There once lived the king who announced an award for the artist who would paint the best picture depicting peace. Many great painters sent the king several of their best of pieces. One of the pictures among the various, various masterpieces was of a calm lake perfectly mirroring peacefully towering snow-capped mountains, over which was a clear blue sky with fluffy white clouds perfectly reflected on the surface of the water. The picture was perfect. Most of the people who viewed the pictures of, of that piece from various artists thought that it was the best among them all. Yet when the king announced the winner, everyone was shocked. The picture which won the prize had mountains too, but they were rugged and bare. The sky looked very angry. There was even lightning flashes within it. This did not look peaceful at all. It looked like the artist had mistakenly sent in a picture of a storm instead of peace. But when you look closely at the painting, you can see a tiny bush growing in the cracks of the rock. In the bush, a mother bird had built her nest, and in the midst of the rush of angry weather, the bird sat on her nest with peace. The moral of the story says peace does not mean to be in a place that there is no noise or trouble. Peace means to be in the midst of all the chaos and still be calm in the heart. Real peace is the state of mind, not the state of the surroundings. The mother bird that was calm despite her chaotic surroundings indeed was the best representation of peace. 
And that's what Isaiah is telling us. He says, find your peace in the hands of God. Looking to the things of earth or to the things of self or anything else is not going to bring us peace. And Isaiah's prophecy in chapter 8 ends with these words. And they will be thrust into thick darkness. So that brings us to chapter 9. And chapter 9 begins with these words ending where we have been reading here recently. Chapter 9 verse 1 says, But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them a light has shined. shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his, for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult, and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness. From this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. See, I, I hearken back to David's prayer for his son to rule in righteousness and peace. From this time forth and forevermore, that throne would be held by the Prince of Peace. In the prophecy of Isaiah 9, God reveals that one day the darkness will come to light. The time of struggle, the fighting, the wars, the sickness, within the midst, a baby would be born. And he will take the burden of rulership. That's what it means to... The, to have the government on his shoulders. He is going to be the ruler of all things. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Yet the words chosen for Prince of Peace are defined as, of course, the Prince is usually the Son of the King. Is usually giving the rule over the people. And then the word that Isaiah uses in the original Hebrew language for peace, you may be familiar with, shalom. And shalom means peace between people and nations. And when we read the prophecy of Micah saying the ruler was to come from, or when we read the prophecy of Micah saying the ruler was coming from Bethlehem, Micah goes on to say in Micah 5 verse 4 through 5, and he, this Messiah to come, shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. He shall be their peace. You see, in Isaiah, the verse after uh, chapter 9 verse 6 in verse 7 he says of the babe to come of the increase of his government oops sorry I was thinking I had that <laughs> whoops <laughs> of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore the zeal of the Lord of hosts would do this the Prince of Peace, the one that is to come as a baby, will be the ruler, the Prince, whose dominion shall never end. But I can hear you asking, but where's my peace today? We look around, we look out our doors, out our windows, we pull up the internet, we turn on the TV, and we see no peace. 
We see wars and rumors of wars. We see violence and killing. We see broken families. We see sickness and death. A virus that's rampaging across the world, taking with it millions of victims. We see divorce, families broken, a world choosing sin over righteousness. And maybe you yourself are suffering right now. You see, I'm always reminded of this time of year and realizing that there are many that are not doing so well. That although the Christmas season, the Christmas holiday brings about joy and peace for many of us, there are others that are lonely. There are others that are suffering loss because they lost a loved one recently. There are those that are within a family, but yet feel unloved. There are those that are suffering with mental health issues, anxiety, depression, because things aren't the way that they're supposed to be. It's not the way we pictured Christmas for ourselves. If you look at all this, let alone sitting around the table and Certain topics come up. You see division brought forth within your own family. So where is our peace? Let me read to you another fictional story here. One day the most peaceful inhabitants from the earth asked one very powerful wizard to stop all wars and bloodshed on the planet. That is simple, he said. I will destroy all the weapons on the earth, and nobody will be able to fight anymore. Yeah, that would be great, the people exclaimed. And with the magic wand's wave, it was done. And there was, in fact, peace on earth. For about three days. See, while the majority of those continued to, that, that were prone to fight, they sought and could not find a weapon. So eventually they understood they've lost their weapons for good. So they began to make spears of small trees of which they could start to fight again. And when the wizard heard this bad news, he said, don't worry, I'll destroy all the young trees so they will not be able to fight. After two or three days of useless searching for young trees suitable for making spears, rebellious people started cutting giant trees to make batons for them. And then the bloodshed started again. Then the wizard destroyed all the big trees. Then humans made knives and swords of metal. So he destroyed all the metal on the planet. People then made slings and began to throw stones at each other. So it was necessary then to, of course, destroy all the stones too. And then the peacekeepers began to worry. All the trees have disappeared. There's no more metal, no more stones. How are we going to live? What are we going to eat? There will be no vegetation soon. And people will die even without fighting. No, this is the wrong solution to the problem. And so the wizard became confused. I do not know how to behave now. I would have destroyed all humanity, but unfortunately that's not within my power. And the peacekeepers then fell into despair. They did not know what to do. And then one clever child turned to the wizard. I know what you should do. Let people feel how others perceive their actions. If one person hurts someone, let him feel the same pain. And if he brings joy to someone, let him feel the same joy. So no one will hurt each other because he will feel the pain immediately too and would have to stop. And all the people were inspired by the greatness of the child's thought, and the wizard realized the child's idea was good. He returned all the trees, stones, and metal. And since that day, nobody on the planet tried to hurt his neighbor, because he would have to feel the same pain too. People began to help each other because they liked the sense of joy they felt at this moment. And they began to live in harmony and joy. See, friends, peace is found in love. 
when we love each other, which is what the story ends up finding the solution. When we truly love each other, when one of us hurts, we hurt with them. When one of us has joy, we have joy with them. And yes, we do find ourselves more willing to do good so that others might have joy, so then we too have their joy as well. In the New Testament, the Greek term for peace is irene or erene. And it means unity and accord. And isn't that what we all wish for, pray for? Not only at Christmas, but at all times. Seeing Jesus before he was crucified and he made his great high priest prayer. He prayed that, his, that the world would know his followers because of our love for each other. He prayed that we would be in unity with one another in love. And I believe Jesus came and taught how to live this way. You see, you think about it. He tells us to love our neighbors as ourselves. To do good to those that have wronged us. To even love our enemies. All of which is hard, it is difficult, and not within our own power to do. But imagine what kind of peace that would bring to the world. What kind of difference it would make if the followers of Christ would take to heart and do these things. Then we can bring Christmas to everyone all year round. We'd be to bring peace into all situations. But to do that, as I said, we can't do it within our own power. We need the power of God. We need the knowledge of his love for ourselves. And maybe you haven't experienced God's love for yourself. You see, Jesus is God's gift of love to humanity. Jesus is God's peace offering to us. Because of our disobedience, the scripture tells us that we are enemies of God. The Apostle Paul, a former prosecutor of Christians, says that we were once alienated and hostile in mind doing evil deeds. We have all done evil. We have all done wrong. Paul says in Ephesians 2, verse 1 through 3. There we go. Without Christ, he says, you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. And we were, by nature, children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. Oops. <laughs> Wrong one. However, he also gives us, as Isaiah said, we would be walking in darkness. Those who are far off from God, he gives us some hope. If we continue on in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13 through 14, 17 through 18. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to God the Father. He is our peace. Christ alone is our priest. Peace, excuse me. He is our priest too, but he is our peace. 
bringing about unity between us and God and truly us and others if we allow it to do so. You see, Christ the Prince of Peace has made us right with God through his sacrifice on the cross. You see, God gave of us, gave of himself to us, the Prince of Peace, born as a baby, raised by human parents. And this baby grew up and never sinned. He taught God's word. He showed God's word and God's in obedience to God and how he walked and how he treated others. And it cost him his life. He went to the cross bearing the sins that you and I have committed because he committed none. But he did so to bring about peace between the sinner and the holy God. He did so because God loved us, loves you that much that he wanted to reconcile the world to himself. So in his love, he offered up the best he could give, the gift of his son, the one that we worship and that we recognize the birth of the baby in the stable, lying in a manger. The baby grew up to be our Savior. Of course, it's always my hope and prayer that you have trusted in that truth. That you have repented, meaning turn away from your unbelief. That you have turned away from living in obedience to your flesh and to your mind, as Paul said we did. And that you turn to faith in Christ. In the Savior that we celebrate at Christmas. And whom we also celebrate at Easter. Because when he died, he did not stay in the grave. He rose three days later, showing that God took him as our payment. And guarantees for us that believe in him. And trust in him. And eternal life with him in the future. So it's always my prayer that you believe that and that you walk in obedience to him every day but I also know that some of you are still wrestling though you're a believer you wrestle with having peace instead it seems as though everything around you is still falling apart everything around you is chaos I tell you, the peace of God, the peace of Christ is right there with you now where you are. Remember the picture that we talked about with the little bird. Though she was in the midst of chaos and storms and darkness and gloominess, she had peace because she knew whose she was. She knew that she belonged to the God of the universe, the creator of all things who created and knit her. And she trusted in his care. Listen to Jesus' words, John chapter 14, verse 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. And in John 16, 33, Jesus says, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So what if we truly find our resting place in the midst of all the negative noise around us? all the chaos if we close our eyes we breathe in deeply and we settle into the peace of Christ he has offered it and given it to us and does not take it back from us his peace is always available it is always there God is always with us. And he is the Prince of Peace. 
As the angels are recorded as saying in Luke chapter 2, verse 14, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Let us pray. Father of peace, Lord God, we give you thanks and praise knowing you are the author of peace. And you have given it to us through your Son, Jesus Christ. On what we picture as a peaceful night, we understand there's chaos. There was hardship. And we understand that through the life of Jesus, he too experienced hardships, darkness, anxiety, depression, hurt, violence. And yet he too hung on to the peace knowing that you were with him. Remembering God is with us. And you tell us you will never leave or forsake us. So in the midst of whatever storms of life come around us right now, Father, we pray that you help us to settle into the peace that only comes from you. For it is in Christ's name we pray. Amen.